everyone. How you doing? If you're new here, all right. All right, we'll, we'll try to do better. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and I have some explaining to do. <laughs> some of you probably came in here this morning and said, oh, I wonder what he's going to preach about today. If you've been in church for a long time, you've probably seen something called a youth takeover. Have you seen that? A youth takeover? Do you know why they have youth takeovers? Anybody? Don't worry, I'll tell you. <clears throat> they were invented because of complaints. That's why. They were invented because of complaints. What happens as a pastor, right? You get all kinds of meetings about things that don't matter. I've talked about this in the past. I complain as a result of complaining, about complaining. So you have all these really important meetings, people in crisis, you know, you're dealing with some important stuff as a pastor, and then you get that meeting, right, you know, where it's about the music being too loud, or we should do hymns, or something like that, it doesn't matter. And so this is what happened, <clears throat> I don't know, probably 1967, I'm just going to guess. Some really brilliant pastor, want to give him a name? James Clark, sounds interesting. So James Clark, in 1967, had a series of really bad meetings. And finally he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to let the youth take over, right? So he just got like a rock band up there, kids trying to be Jimi Hendrix on the stage. Just made a total disaster. Next week, people came in the office, complained about that. He said, well, it's going back to normal. We could let the youth take over again. And reduce the amount of complaints. So that doesn't work here because our youth are very responsible. We have very responsible youth here. It's kind of weird, actually. My daughter in particular is especially cautious. She does normal teenage things. I'll stop. Don't worry, Sophie. But she's very unusually cautious. So it won't work here. So you know what we do here? Baby takeover. This is baby takeover Sunday at C3 Church. Now, the problem is, we were supposed to do it. I told them, I gave them the announcements, listen, guys, you got to do it on the week. I talk about the milk, right? Paul saying, it's for baby, you're a bunch of babies, you don't understand, I got to give you milk. But the problem is, they can't read calendars. So, we just got to deal with it. This is going to have nothing at all to do with our message this morning. Oh, our friends at NPAC, that is Naples Performing Arts Center, have shows. This is for Matilda, am I correct about that? We had Frozen a couple weeks ago. That was really cool. Now we have Matilda. So we can have some fun. I tried the slide. Didn't work. <clears throat> that would have went viral with this thing smashing down and like killing a whole bunch of people except me. The hole would just go right over me. And so we're not going to do that this morning. I can't really have as much fun as I want to with the set. I want to address something this morning before we begin in our Corinthians series or continue in our Corinthians series before I begin actually talking about things that really matter. <clears throat> I want to talk about the notes. Staying on the notes. So last week, something came out of my mouth. I said, hey, can I get off the notes? Something to that effect, right? Is it okay if I get off the notes for a second, guys, and just start talking? And then it sparked all these conversations, right? What's better, being on the notes or not being on the notes? And this is the way everybody is. I talk about this when it comes to scripture and all kinds of stuff. Everybody wants it like here or here. It can never be both. Can't. You guys aren't satisfied with that. So it's really difficult. And I'm like, well, both. You know, sometimes it's good to be on the notes and sometimes, no, no, no. You got to get off the notes or on the notes. One or the other, Gene. You got to pick it. So, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'll tell you why. One thing you got to know is I'm communicating with more people <clears throat> than just right here or in the balcony. And as we fill in, I got to mention that. You guys can sit in the balcony if you want to. I can't really see in the balcony, so you could throw stuff at me. It would be fun. <clears throat> I'm also communicating with the media team. They have my notes ahead of time, right? So they know when to queue up the scriptures and stuff like that. We also translate the services into Spanish. So it's being translated into Spanish in real time. All right, so I give them my notes too. So when I go too far off the notes, like right now, sorry, Alicia, <laughs> they kind of got to keep up with me, right? And they say, I talk fast. I'm like, no, you guys talk fast. So anyway, we had that discussion. I'm trying to slow down, not really. So I'm really talking to them, right? Is it okay if I go off the notes, guys? Hang on, here we go, right? So there are a lot of different things to consider. The other thing you have to consider if you're doing this, if you're me right now, is you've got to be careful. You're handling God's Word. You've got to get it right. And so you've got to stay in the lanes. You know, you can do some fancy driving, but you've got to keep it in the guardrails. It's very, very important. A lot of modern-day preachers they do what's called like the big idea kind of sermon. They give you their big idea. They give you 
some scriptures, and then 30 to 50 minutes of their opinion and stuff about themselves and their kids. Not good. It's dangerous. So what you want to do is you want to always validate your opinions with scriptures. This is biblical preaching. This is what the writers of the New Testament did. If you have the kind of Bible that outlines that, it puts the Old Testament scriptures in bold. Go to Romans 9 or 10. It's like scripture, 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 scripture. They're validating the point with scripture. That's what we're supposed to do. It's what I'm not doing right now, unfortunately. So I'm going to end this section. The other thing you don't have to worry about me sacrificing is this. We're have a little fun. <clears throat> you don't have to worry about me making you turn to the person next to you and say something that you might not mean. <laughs> I could tell everybody who's church here right now. All right, so here's my viewpoint on it. We've got we to gotta just rip the Band-Aid off here. From my viewpoint, that is manipulation, right? Because I don't know if everyone really means that, right? I could be making you or pressuring you into saying something you don't mean. Maybe you're a grump. I don't know. You don't agree. Maybe it's totally true, but you don't believe that. So what are you going to do now? You're forced to look like a grumpy person or just say what you don't believe. So let's have some fun. Let's say I come up with the idea that we're all created in God's image, right? So that must mean that we're all beautiful. So I just want to make everybody feel good today, right? That fills up the church. So let's do that, right? <clears throat> I got scriptures, Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made. We're created in God's image. So don't do it. Everybody look at the person next to you and say, you're beautiful. Don't do that. Because some of you might not mean that, right? <laughs> Nah, you just lie. You couldn't lie with your face. Now you're going to lie with your mouth. What if grumpy old guy's here? Remember I introduced you to grumpy old guy last week? What if he shows up again? <clears throat> he comes into church. Now we, I'll introduce you to a new character. We've got a new character coming in. It's nice lady. So nice lady sits next to grumpy old guy. Notice I didn't say nice old lady. Smart. So we got those two sitting next to one another. Now nice lady, she has a better attitude than I do. She actually likes this part of the service. It's her favorite part. I wonder what the pastor is going to manipulate me into saying this morning, you know. So she's ready for it. She sits down. I say, all right, everybody, turn to the person next to you and, oh, what, what, what? Say, you're beautiful. Oh, yes. You are beautiful, grumpy old guy. Well, she didn't say that because she doesn't know yet. I hope he's single. Right, so <laughs> this is the reaction she gets. She's devastated. Her life is ruined. She's rejected flatly all she can think about, another lonely date night with the cats. So I'm not going to do that to you guys. I'm just setting everyone in here up for failure if I do that. Another thing you don't have to worry about is grumpy old guy. He left the church because I let women speak in it. And that brings me to today's topic, <clears throat> secondary doctrine. And like, I had to fix this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Got to really warm you up. Secondary doctrine, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I'll get on the notes. Base, here we go. <clears throat> Stop telling jokes. Okay. Secondary doctrine is anything that is not the gospel. I talked about this a little bit. I planted a seed last week, right? How people make my life difficult, they make it hard, because they take secondary doctrine and they bring it to gospel level. We talked about things that are not Gospel. Last week it was marriage and divorce, right? Stuff that doesn't save or unsave you. There is your gospel decision that saves you or not. And then there are other decisions that we make that don't unsave us once we're saved, once we've made that gospel decision. You can't lose your salvation over these other decisions. Doesn't mean they're not important. We'll talk about that a little later. <clears throat> but I've got to take it easy. We've got to ease our way into it. So let's hop right into an issue. We're going to see here, we're in the eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to try to explain this to you, make it easy to understand, because in a modern context, it's kind of weird. So let's just read the text, and then I will try to unpack it for you. We're going to jump around a little bit, but I'm trying to make this make sense for you. So Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, about eating food offered to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one. You see the quotation marks really quickly. He's quoting them in the first quote. So there's letters going back and forth, and he's kind of like quoting what they're saying and correcting it, 
the second one, Deuteronomy 6.4, and quoting them. It's a little bit of both. Paul's quite clever. However, <clears throat> not everyone has this knowledge. In fact, some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food offered to an idol, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not make us acceptable to God. We are not inferior if we don't eat, and we are not better if we do eat. Both. So you can see that his sentiment on a non-gospel issue is similar to marriage, remarriage, divorce last week. So quickly, 1 Corinthians 7, 27. Are you bound to a wife? Are you married? Do not seek to be loosed or divorced. Are you loosed or divorced from a wife? Do not seek a wife. However, if you do get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin, someone who has not been married, <coughs> marries, she has not sinned. All right? Not sin. Don't worry so much about it. Meat, sacrifice to idols. I'm going to try to explain this to you. If you know what this is all about, bear with me. We could have very new people here, right? And this is a weird thing. What do you mean, meat sacrifice to idols? If we go back, it's almost the beginning of the Bible, the fourth chapter, Genesis 4.4, we see animal sacrifice. What's it for? Why are they doing that? Well, to worship God. As we see things develop, we get into the law, the law of Moses, and we start seeing animal sacrifices for the forgiveness of various sins, right? atonement, just to make up for various sins. The idea generally here is that your sin goes into the animal, especially the Day of Atonement, the animal sacrificed, and then the animal sheds the blood instead of you. You deserve the punishment, the animal gets it instead. That's basically the idea. So the Israelites, later to become Jews, they would call them that later, are doing this even in the time of the New Testament in Corinth. They're doing this kind of stuff. They're doing it in Jerusalem. But we also have Gentiles doing that. And they are sacrificing the animals to idols, to non-gods. Okay? Israelites, good. Sacrificing to the one and only true God. All these other pagans, they're doing it to other fake beings. They're not gods. They're idols. Right? So this is meat. It becomes meat when you kill it. <laughs> Sacrificed to idols. All right. So... You could be eating this meat for a couple of different reasons. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're involved in this pagan worship. You were pagan first, and then you become a Christian. You don't know. You're like, I don't know. I like sacrificing these idols to the idols and eating the meat. Maybe. Also, another plausible situation in Corinth is that they're in the meat market. They don't know what meat was sacrificed to an idol or not sacrificed to an idol. So what do you do with that? Right? We talked about that last week, like the victims of divorce, two people coming into the faith, one person, or one person coming into the faith, the other spouse not, and I'm leaving. Well, now we've created a different situation. Jesus didn't talk about that, so Paul's got to deal with it. Here's another situation. We don't know. I go to the meat market, I get my meat. Do I ask? Do I not ask? I don't know. So Paul's got to say, don't worry about it, kind of. So <clears throat> we have another situation. We've got to go to Acts 15 to get there. You've heard me talk about this before in the last few months. It's really, really important. It is a pivotal chapter in Acts. So we have the four Gospels, then we have Acts, which is a history of the early church. <clears throat> what you have in the beginning, like Jesus and the Gospels, he's really not dealing with a whole lot of Gentiles. You can kind of count it on less than one hand, how many times he really deals with Gentile believers. They're all Jews. He is the Jewish Messiah that is seen in the beginning, not as Christianity, but as a Jewish sect, mostly Jewish people. So we get into the history of the early church, and it isn't until the 10th chapter that Peter's really dealing with this. He's going, oh, he gets the vision from God. There's Cornelius. Oh, Gentiles, they're going to be welcomed into the faith, even though it was in the scriptures before, too. It doesn't matter what Jesus said. They weren't listening. So <clears throat> chapter 10, Gentiles finally coming into the faith. But it takes them a little time. I think something like seven years <laughs> later, they're dealing with another issue in the churches. There are some Jewish people, right? so Jewish converts to Christianity, who are kind of saying, you know, it's not fair that these Gentiles can come in and they don't have to obey the law of Moses and they don't have to get circumcised. So if you know what that is, we're all grown-ups here. Imagine that. Imagine you're not circumcised, guys. And you're like, yeah, come on in. Christianity is great, but we got to do this thing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> talk about a test of the sincerity of your faith. So it could be an impediment. I'm going to be really careful now and go back to the notes. So 
<clears throat> this question comes up. <laughs> Do the Gentile believers have to become Jewish first? Fair question. So it comes on Paul's desk. So Paul, Barnabas, Titus, they go to Jerusalem. Why do they go to Jerusalem? Jerusalem is like the mother church. And at Jerusalem, James, Jesus' brother, is like the overseer there. Okay? He's in charge. A lot of heavy hitters there. Peter's hanging out. He's the lead apostle, if you don't know. And so they bring the question. They have a debate about it. Do the Gentiles, this is anyone who's not Jewish, do they need to become Jewish, essentially? The circumcision and following the law. What's up? Debate about it a little bit, and this is what comes down the line. It'll all start to make sense in a second. Acts 15, starting at verse 28. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours to put no greater burden on you, the Gentiles, than these necessary things. One, that you abstain from food offered to idols. Ooh, there it is. From blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. So, right there at the top of the list. Food, sacrifice to idols. James is like, no bueno, don't do that. I just messed the translator up. <clears throat> so, we have four things. They're important. Yet, we're going to see, that's a good ringtone, that it is secondary doctrine. <laughs> he doesn't say, you won't be saved if you don't avoid these things, does he? No, you'll do well. Yet, doctrine divides, doesn't it? Doctrine divides. There are over 40,000 Christian denominations. Think about that for a second. I didn't believe it when I first heard it. But, you know, I read every single one, all 40,000. <laughs> Think about that for a second. For about, there's like a couple little splits, but for about the first 1,000 years of Christianity, not so much. You had the Great Schism in 1054. That's the Eastern Church and the Western Church. What we would know today is like Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic split. And then after that, and it's not over the gospel. It's not what the split was about. It was not over a gospel issue. Secondary doctrine, almost all of it. It's not unbelievable. So, we're non denom here. What does that mean? Well, that means we keep the main thing the main thing. Like when I walked in and saw the set today. So, main thing the main thing. That's what I did. We don't bug out over little things, right? So, okay, it's not great. I'll talk about it in a minute. We do take it seriously, but... Keep the gospel here. We don't fight with one another over the other things. We can be friends. We can be brothers and sisters in Christ and disagree on other things. Not the gospel. Not the gospel. That's the main thing. So, secondary doctrine. Anything that isn't the gospel. It's the blanket statement. Anything that cannot save or unsave you is secondary doctrine. So, just as the early church had the Judaizers, read Galatians, they're the ones coming in and saying, yeah, everybody needs to get circumcised, follow the law of Moses, or you can't be saved. Well, the church today has its own form of Judaizers saying, no, 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 they have to do all these things, it's just as important, they're not saved, or they got a problem, or we got to yell at them, whatever it is. They're making these issues just as important as the one and only true gospel that saves. You don't want to do that. But doesn't mean we don't ignore it. All right? No greasy grace. We spoke of divorce last week, right? That <clears throat> whatever happens is kind of like secondary doctrine. If you're a Christian and you happen to get divorced for whatever reason, or you get remarried for whatever reason, it doesn't unsave you. You are saved. You will not lose your salvation. But it doesn't mean we don't take it seriously and try. What it does mean is that we shouldn't squabble about it. We shouldn't be backbiting. It should not cause division in the church. So at this point, what I want to do is I want to make this primary doctrine really, really clear. This is important. We're going to jump ahead and we're going to look at the basics. We're going to go to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And we'll get a window in here, a little, little summary of what we're going to go over when we get there. So Paul writes this. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it, and you have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it, if you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve, and he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one abnormally or untimely born, he also appeared to me. Okay, mouthful, it's a lot to remember. So, if you're having trouble articulating the gospel, I'm going to teach you a little something this morning. It's pretty easy. You have to ask and answer three questions, and you'll get there. Really simple. Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do? What does that mean to us? If you can answer those three questions, you've almost got the gospel. There. Jesus is God. Unambiguously so. I don't have time this morning, otherwise I would rattle off, you know me, all the scriptures. We will not have time for that. He is God. <clears throat> Jesus died on a cross for the forgiveness of sins, and he rose from the dead. That's what he did. Three, what does that mean? What's the point? Well, by accepting and confessing that Jesus is Lord, and he's your Savior, we'll have eternal life and rise from the dead, just as he did. Now, sidebar for all you Bible scholars out there. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> We're going to be discussing this at Bible study. What does it mean, though, for Jesus to really be our Lord? Luke 6.46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? <laughs> and don't do the things I say. We can judge a lot about the sincerity of someone's faith based on how closely they are following Jesus' commands, and this includes the secondary doctrine. So I'm not letting anybody off the hook today. Sorry. I had to pump the brakes. So that is the primary doctrine, the gospel. We must, I cannot leave this out, receive the Holy Spirit. You must be baptized in water and the Spirit. Read John 3 again if you don't believe me. And there is only one unforgivable sin, and that is connected to the baptism. We must not reject God. We must not reject the Holy Spirit. We must not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Read Mark 3. You'll see Jesus says that. So, on today's issue... It is remarkable, remarkable that this, the meat sacrifice to idols, was one of the four main things. Think about it for a second, right? Paul goes there. What do we do? There's 613 commands in the law of Moses. Pick four, you know? Wow. So these are the important things Gentiles are supposed to abstain from. Yet, Paul is flexible in it. That should amaze us. He's not hung up on it. Why? No. There's only one unforgivable sin and only one true gospel that saves. In fact, the main reason here that Paul gives for even caring about this secondary issue revolves around caring for others. That's what it revolves around. Not causing someone else to stumble or sin. So he says, go ahead and eat the meat, but 1 Corinthians 8, starting at verse 9, but be careful that this right of yours <clears throat> in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has this knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? Therefore, if food causes my brother to fall, I will never eat meat again, so that I won't cause my brother to fall. That dramatic pause was for Alex. <clears throat> it's an inside joke. He likes his bacon. <clears throat> He's shaking his head right now, I'm sure. We must care for others by leading by example. It is always best if we, if we lead by example. Not just words, right? As I mentioned last week. We shouldn't be pointing fingers either if we're just as sinful as the person we're pointing at. Sorry, Alex. <clears throat> we should only be making these judgments to discern things, or if we're in a position in leadership in church where that's what we're called to do, or if we're invited in. That's inside the church. Outside the church. People who aren't Christians don't necessarily know these rules. They haven't signed up for the rules either. Remember, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 5, starting verse 12, Paul writes, For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? The answer is yes. But God judges outsiders. So for those inside the church, 
There's a process we go through, right? In Matthew 18, we see that, that kind of like three-step process. The goal is what? Reconciliation. Not to kick people out of the church. That's the goal. Reconciliation. But we should not skip to step three. We shouldn't jump ahead. we got to go through one, right? One, one. Let me talk to you, buddy. Can I see something? Two, accountability. We bring other people in. Three, tell it to the broader church in a sense. We'll get there another week. There's a process. And we don't skip to step three. So how crazy is it? How nutty do we look as Christians when we skip to step three outside the church? We tell it to everybody. Think about it. Let's use an example. This is going to be good. (laughs) We talked about lusts last week and adultery. Jesus is teaching on that. Matthew 5, verse 27. Let's just do a little review. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Remember we talked about that practically? (laughs) Gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Wow. All right. I'm going to give you a little example of how that could play out. So let's say I read that. Sorry about that. I read that. I think, you know, here's the real issue going on. I got my own problems, right? So I need to broadcast other people's problems. No one's looking at me. So I get my Christian megaphone out. Yep. I'm going to go out on the street. I'm going to tell people what's what about Matthew 5, adultery and lusts. So I run into this crew. Remember Tommy Two-Tone? <clears throat> he and his wife, this is, see if you get that, you're good. You know, 80s rock. <clears throat> Him and his wife pass me by. And there comes Jenny. Jenny comes by. I'm giving too many clues here. Tommy does that. I catch him. Catch Tommy in the act. I got to let everybody know, right? Because that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We got to let everybody know, sir, you've just committed adultery. And that's what happens. His wife is like, what? 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 And he's freaking out, freaking out. Now, no, 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 no. I'm faithful. I've not committed. I don't know this guy. I don't know what he's talking about. Sir, you just committed adultery with her. She's an adulteress too, by the way. Now she's freaking out. Jenny's upset. And they're like, wait a minute. I've never seen this guy in my life. Well, he saw you all right. All right. Now they're freaking out. And they're talking about, they're like, no, no, no. No. We've never done it. You can do it with your eyeballs. They're like, that's gross. That's crazy. What are you doing? You're making this stuff up. Jesus made it up. It's in the Bible. If you read the Bible, you would have gouged your eyeballs out and we wouldn't be talking about this right now. Now they're like, they're all going crazy. And here's what happens. My eyeballs now notice what Tommy noticed about Jenny. And he catches me. Hey, you're an adulterer too. Hypocrite, adulterer. No, sir. No, I'm not. I'm a Christian. All things are permissible for me. (laughs) Somebody knows their scriptures over there. We use that. So first he's protesting, no, that's not fair. Double standards, hypocrisy. Ah!" Then he stops and realizes. That sounds pretty cool. I would love to become a Christian and just do whatever I want. Isn't that how it works? Well, sir... We make it a pretty hard club to get into. We won't even let Kanye in. (laughs) Why won't you let Kanye in? (gasps) Is it because he's... No, 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 no. It's not that. No, 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 no. No, Jesus was not white. No, no. (laughs) Got to get on the notes in a second. It's because of Kim. If we let her in the church, we'll all have to gouge our eyeballs out. Back on the notes, base. <clears throat> scriptures, scriptures. First Corinthians 8, starting at verse 1. About food offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge inflates with pride. But love builds up. 
So clearly, another knock at the wisdom of the world if you've been following along. But what does Paul contrast it with? Love. So on any issue, we can do what the Pharisees did. We can go to the text and we can broadcast it. What everybody's doing wrong. With hate in our hearts. We can inform everybody. But what does Jesus say? Put down the stones. And to us today, and the megaphones. Start loving people. If it isn't in a loving way, it will not be received because it has not been delivered the way Jesus said to deliver it. Love is about putting yourself in someone else's shoes and walking a few miles in them. It's about listening with your ears and not your mouth. It's about talking with love in your heart, thinking with your heart involved. So today, we're going to talk about an organization which is doing things the loving way on the topic of abortion. Pregnancy Resource Center shows love versus picketing with the microphone. We could get out there with the signs and the megaphones and broadcast our ideas to everyone, or there could be another way that we could handle this issue in a loving way. So I believe we're going to watch video first. Let's queue up the video. And then we'll have uh, Janet from Pregnancy Resource Center come up. She's executive director of the Resource Center of Southwest Florida. So let's take a look at this. PRC has a heart for the unborn. In 2018, PRC provided 3,912 services and classes that empowered moms to care for themselves and their child. 548 pregnancy tests were provided. 341 patients saw a sonogram, each one providing a view into the womb where life had begun. Best of all, 224 babies were saved in 2018. 877 parenting classes were taught to strengthen families and empower single moms. 12 fathers were mentored through our mentoring program. 16 mothers and babies were introduced to the life-affirming community of the local church. 30 women took our post-abortion class and they found wholeness and restoration. We're excited about the 98 Bible studies that were taught this past year where women came wanting to know more about Christ. How do we do all this? Through partners like you and the 4,000 volunteer hours that were provided by advocates, nurses, and mentors. This kind of support allowed PRC to provide 1,536 patients with life-affirming care. Because of your support and prayer, PRC's heart for the unborn is seen in action every single day. Beating with the love of Jesus to affirm life because every life matters. Hi, so happy to be with you uh, this morning uh, and introduce ourselves to you. Some of you know of us already, if not, Great opportunity to say hello. So we are the Pregnancy Resource Center. We are a network of pregnancy clinics and education centers throughout Lee and Collier, serving women who feel they have no choice but to terminate their pregnancy because simply they lack support, education, and assistance. Um, through our network, um, as you saw, we're able to reach women uh, at critical times when they really are making a life decision as your pastor um, so introduced us, we're not necessarily the ones outside of Planned Parenthood picketing, though we are grateful for that. Uh, there is a justice side to the pro-life movement, and that comes legally as we seek to um, instill laws in our country that protect the most innocent, the unborn. But what we do is we really have an opportunity um, to step into the lives of women who really lack um, education. They have really no idea that it is a real life human being being formed in the womb. They really do believe that it is just a blob of tissue. So through our ultrasounds, through our advocate care, 
through our uh, physician on staff, we have the opportunity to educate her, to show her that it is a real life human being endowed with infinite worth and value and possibility just like she is. So one of the great things we get to do is we really get to tell her that we believe in her, that she too has been endowed with dignity, value, and worth through our creator God. This value comes to her as a gift from God as she's an image bearer. It's not determined by the culture, which is where she's coming from. This year alone, we have given... Um, almost 1,300 classes already, and already through the end of October, 193 babies have been rescued. So we are, we are eager and with high expectancy believe that we will surpass uh, last year's number. One of the great things that we are also in the middle of, we are in the middle of a campaign to build a home uh, to house up to 12 of our critical patients who really need to be removed from either a violent situation or a pressurized home life where it is the pressures around her really that are pushing her towards the termination. This guest home will um, welcome them in, provide home, security, um, all the other resources that we have, but they'll have a safe place to live with 24-hour supervision and a real immersive program that our hope is to really change the trajectory of their lives in order to then introduce them to local life-affirming communities, local churches like you all. So wouldn't it be great if a year from now you had some men and women here in your community here at 3C who at one point were against God, against life, and found the rescue, life-giving message of the gospel? So we want to partner with you and introduce ourselves and give you a ton of different ways that you can. We have a table out in the lobby that we'd love to talk to you about. Most urgent right now is we are having our annual Walk for Life on December 7th. Uh, Phil and Jennifer, uh, team members here, are going to lead a C3 walk team. So it's really simple. Pretty much you sign up, you go tell your friends, they can pledge a certain amount, whatever they want towards your account, and in the end, C3 has a walk team with a gift for PRC. On December 7th, we walk. It's not, it's not miles and miles, let me just tell you. It is really more about showing the community the breadth and the width of the pro-life community here in Leon Collier. Over 17 partnering churches will be there. We have over 350 that come. There's kids, there's rides, there's food. We have a DJ, we have real fun, and we celebrate life and the rescuing of children. If I told you that there were over 5,000 babies killed through abortion in Lee and Collier every year, what would you say? Did you know that we have five abortion providers here in our community, two of them in Fort Myers, that do abortions up to 24 weeks of life? We have hundreds and thousands of your very neighbors who feel they have no other choice but to terminate because they don't know about you. They don't know about this community that will stand with them, walk with them, support them, and be that friend, that voice for life when others are not saying that. So I ask that you would consider joining us, joining the walk team. Come and learn about us. We do orientations quarterly. We have one coming up in January. We have lots of opportunities to volunteer, uh, both for nurses, uh, physicians, and advocates who are the ones that really commit to walk with these precious moms. Men commit to walk to, with these precious fathers for up to 16 months. So if you really want to do real discipleship, where you have an opportunity to share the gospel, live the gospel, and impact your life for the gospel, let me invite you to come in and look and learn about us. I really am excited over the possibility of partnering with you. With our Naples Clinic, there's lots of women right in our very own neighborhood that can use your love and support. 
So come out, get to know us. I look forward to seeing many of you at our walk. And I also want to say, we charge nothing for our services. Women's re women receive pregnancy testing, free sonogram. We do STD testing and treatment for some of the most horrific STD diseases that are really ravaging our community. We also do the abortion pill reversal, which if women take the abortion pill and choo choose to change their mind, can find a resource of support in us. And last, well, since we began this partnership, we have saved on nine babies so far. Each of these babies are alive and healthy and well, and to this day, I still get birthday pictures from our very first one four years ago. And he is beautiful. His mom calls him our miracle baby. So uh, let me know any way that I can answer questions. We take no government funding, so obviously we survive out of your generosity. Love to tell you more about that. And thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor, for being so generous with your time this morning.